Good evening. And welcome to the first night of Lent. Will you please stand and join me in our call to worship? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Our opening prayer is in number 353 in the United Methodist Hymnal, and I do believe it's, yes it is. Let us pray this together. O God, maker of everything and judge of all that you have made, from the dust of the earth you have formed us, and from the dust of death you would raise us up. By the redemptive power of the cross, create in us clean hearts and put within us a new spirit that we may repent of our sins and lead lives worthy of your calling through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 269. We'll sing the first three verses of Lord who throughout these 40 days. The first three verses, number 269. We have two scripture readings tonight. If you'd like to follow along, I believe you'll, that you can follow in the Bibles in your pews or um, feel free to just close your eyes and listen. The first scripture comes from the prophet Joel, chapter 12, verses 12 through 17. The prophet writes these words. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from punishment. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is your God? And our second scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew from the Sermon on the Mount. This is from 
Matthew chapter 6. I'll be reading verses 1 through 6 and then jumping to verses 16 through 21. Jesus says these words, Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And now going to verse 16. And whenever you fast, do not look somber like the, like the hypocrites, for they mark their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent. Last night we celebrated Fat Tuesday or Shrove Tuesday or Carnival. It goes by, by many names. It's where tradition has that we enjoy the riches of life and then go into a, a time of sacrifice and purification as we prepare for the Holy Week season and follow Jesus through the cross to his resurrection. Lent, the word Lent, comes from the German word meaning spring, which is because of the, year, the time of year that Lent always follows. It always comes during the spring, and it comes from the German word meaning spring. And it's customary for us Christians to take this time, this Lenten season, every year, as a time of self-reflection when we think about unpleasant thoughts. We think about our own mortality, and we think about our own sinfulness. That's even hard to say out loud. We think of our own mortality, and we think of our own sinfulness. Bluntly putting this out there, we're sinners, and we're all going to die. None of us make it out of this life alive, and we all leave as sinners. But we remember that there's hope. And Lent is not the end of the story. Lent is not the whole story. Lent only prepares us for the hope to come. We spend this time uniting with Christ, realizing that he suffered, he died, and rose again. And everything that he put up with, everything that he dealt with, we spend this time to unite with Christ in his teachings that he actually did mean what he says. That sometimes before there's redemption, there is suffering. As we unite with Christ in his sufferings, as we fast or, or, or give in to self-denial, or find ways in which to become closer to God, we also do this in hope, remembering that death did not have the final word. We know the end of the story. We know that despite all of the suffering, the, the unimaginable suffering, death did not have the final word. The final enemy was defeated by Jesus. And that's why we observe Lent, to go with Jesus 
through the cross, through the suffering, through his teachings, in order to get to that time of hope, in order to get to the resurrection, where we too one day will be resurrected. We observe Lent as a time of either self-denial or some people choose to take on extra duties or extra spiritual disciplines. You can fast from something during Lent. You can take on extra responsibilities. And even though we take something on or, or we fast from something, we need to remember the purpose of all of this. It can be summed up in what our Methodist founder, John Wesley, called sanctifying grace, where we join Christ in his teachings, in his sacrifice, where we join with Christ in his life to become more Christ-like. And by following the way of Christ, by following him down the path to the Garden of Gethsemane, by following him to the cross, by waiting outside the tomb, we become more Christ-like. And so we give up things or we take on extra responsibilities in order to find a way, however small that might be. But yet we take on extra things or we give up something so that we too can participate in the sacrificial nature of what Jesus did. Now it's important to remember that all of our fasting... All of our good works, they are not what saves us. You can give up everything you want for Lent, and unless you're doing it for the right reasons, you might as well have not done anything. You can take on more, and if you're not doing it for the right reasons, you might as well have lived life as normal. All of our fasting, all of our good works don't save us. But what they do is bring us closer to the image of Christ. They bring us closer to in the path of discipleship. So as we look at our gospel lesson, we get some really important teachings. And though Jesus meant these for everyday life, Jesus was giving his Sermon on the Mount for how to live every day as a follower of Christ. But we can certainly apply this to Lent. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, and whenever you fast, do not look somber like the hypocrites, for they mark their faces and show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And when your father sees in, and what your father sees in secret, will, he will reward you. That's a short. That, that's a long way of saying, as we fast or as we take on extra responsibilities, we're really not supposed to broadcast what we do. We're really not supposed to make a show of what we are giving up or what we are taking on. To put it a little bluntly and a little crassly. Is that a word, crassly? To be crass about it. If your Lenten fast or your Lenten disciplines are making other people miserable, you're doing it wrong. Let me say that again. If your Lenten discipline is making everybody else miserable, you are doing it wrong. Let me give you an example. Every year there's always somebody who gives up chocolate for Lent. Very acceptable thing to do. I'm a chocoholic, and I have trouble doing that. I will never forget, every time somebody gives up chocolate, it's as if their whole world has crashed. I remember a person would come in and a, into church and just look completely miserable. I thought, goodness, were you were up all night. What happened? Is your family sick? I gave up chocolate. I, I, I'm sorry, I, you know, this is, uh, I'm sorry, you know, you can always change your Lenten discipline. No, I'll be okay. <laughs> Giving up chocolate makes you limp. I never got the, 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 the part of, of where all of that comes together. You see, if we make a show of it in that sense, we're doing it wrong. In fact, it might behoove us to 
not tell others what we're doing for Lent unless they ask or unless we think it will edify somebody else. We don't need to be completely secret about it, but it's not a thing to brag about. It's not something that we do for show. It's something that we do so that we become closer to God. Ultimately, if you don't fail this year at it, I can promise you whatever it is you choose to do for Lent, you will fail at one time or another. That chocolate's going to look too good and you're just going to take just one. You're going to do good deeds for people and you're running late and you say, you know what, that person can wait till some other time. Well, if you do eat that chocolate or you don't do that good deed, remember what Lent is ultimately about. It's about the unexplainable grace of God. If you eat the chocolate, if you don't do the good deed, remember that there is forgiveness. In fact, that's the purpose of Lent, that we walk with Jesus to the cross to see that he came to forgive us. It was just a few short years ago. It seems like it was yesterday, almost. It was about this time of year, if I have my calculations right, 2020. The pandemic hit, and suddenly life completely changed. And our lives went from whatever normal was at the time to basically two to three years of Lent. We were giving up fellowship among each other. We were giving up visits with family. We were giving up going out to restaurants. We, were, we, were, we gave up so much for two to three years. Some people are still dealing with that because of compromised immune systems and, and other, issue, other medical issues where they can't be as active as they were before the pandemic. During the pandemic, Lent was basically every day because we were involuntarily giving up so much. Another way to look at Lent is to think that maybe your life has been Lent for so long now. You've sacrificed, you've given things up, you've been a caretaker, you've you've done so much to help others. Maybe life's forced you because of medical diagnoses or, or, or other issues that you've been forced to take on extra responsibilities. So maybe your Lenten discipline could be realizing that now it's time to take care of yourself while you deal with these difficult situations. Maybe your Lenten discipline should be to care for yourself as a beloved child of God. You know, for us Christians, it's hard to say, I need help. It's hard to say, I need to take some time for myself to recharge. Some of us feel more guilty about it than others. And yet God loves us all and wants us to be our best selves. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. So maybe your Lenten discipline is to take your issues seriously and say, I'm going to deal with this problem I've been dealing with so long. I'm going to set aside a day of the week where I can recharge myself. Oh, it might not be giving up chocolate or bread or or donuts but it's giving up that self-pride to say I can do it all it's giving it up and actually saying to God I trust you to get me through these difficult situations many of us already know what we're giving up for Lent many of us already started today some of us are still struggling. What am I going to do? What am I going to give up? Or, or what am I going to take on? Several years ago, Pope Francis published this. And I just want to give this to you. It was in our newsletter, if you read it. But I'd like to read it again to you. He gave us thoughts on what we can give up. Things that actually matter and will change the world for Jesus. Pope Francis wrote, and this is translated, but he wrote, Every year, Christians around the world fast from something in order to spiritually cleanse during Lent. This year, consider fasting from the following. Fast from saying hurtful words. Instead, say kind words. Couldn't we all benefit from that? Rather than saying something that will hurt someone, fast from saying exactly what's on your mind 
think a moment and find a kind way to say it. Fast from selfishness and instead focus on gratitude. Fast from debilitating anger and instead focus on patience. Don't we live in a world now where that's needed more than ever? When someone makes you angry, when something on TV or the news makes you angry, rather than this debilitating anger that often hits us, focus on putting it in God's hands. Fast from unhelpful worry. Instead, focus on trusting God. Fast from grudges. And instead, focus on reconciling with others. How many problems in the world? We look at the governments of the world and we say, if they would just talk to each other, we wouldn't have all these wars, we wouldn't have all this fighting, we wouldn't have all of this this upheaval in the world. And yet we ourselves argue with our brothers and sisters. We argue with our neighbors. We argue with our parents. We argue with our children. We have people that we don't speak to anymore. And maybe that could be fixed just by reaching out. Fast from being harsh and instead focus on compassion. A college professor was teaching a math class and he wrote the nine times tables. Y'all remember those? I even have to sit and do those on my fingers sometimes. But he did like nine times one is nine, nine times two is 18, nine times three is, what is it, 27. And he goes on and he put nine times nine is 90. Now, obviously, we know 9 times 9 is 81. But he put it up there wrong, and and all the students suddenly started laughing at him. And he said, I did this as a lesson for you. Obviously, I know that 9 times 9 is 81, but that's not the, the point of what I did. He said, I got 9 times 1 through 9 times 8 right, and yet you focused on that one mistake that I made. Rather than complimenting me on everything I got right, you focused on the one thing that I put up there wrong. His students were challenged to face that year looking with compassion instead of being harsh with one another. And that lesson stuck with many of his students. Pope Francis goes on and says, Fast from obsession with possessions and instead focus on simplicity. How much can we give up in our lives when we stop focusing on possessions and be thankful for what we have? And finally, he says, fast from sin and instead focus on Jesus. This Sunday, we will begin a worship series, a sermon series, talking about living as as disciples, Growing in faith, hope, and love through your baptismal vows of prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And I thought Lent would be a good time to talk about that. Lent would be a good time to take our vows of membership and our vows of baptism seriously. Because if all this Jesus stuff is real, it's time for us to take it seriously. He came not only to change our lives, but to change all eternity. And so, hopefully, we can take that and give it back to him. In a moment, I'll give a thanksgiving over the ashes, and I'll ask you to come forward, and you'll receive a a cross on your forehead of the ashes. These ashes remind us of our mortality and our sinfulness. But we also know these ashes will wipe off when you get home. The ashes are not the end of the story. Death is not the end of the story. Sin is not the end of the story. The end of the story is resurrection and salvation. But yet first we remind ourselves of our mortality and of our sinfulness. When you receive the ashes, I'll give you a cross on your forehead and I'll say repent and believe the gospel. If you'd like to find some time to pray at the prayer rail, I'll be stationed in the front there, but there will be places to the side, or feel free to take some moments for silent prayer at your seats.
Let us pray as we give thanksgiving for these ashes. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality and penitence, so that we remember that only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. If we'd like to come forward, um, I don't know, do we have somebody want to usher us through? Or come forward as you feel led. Psalm 51 was written by King David after he sinned with Bathsheba. It's his psalm to beg forgiveness to God. Let us read Psalm 51 verses 1 through 17 responsive, responsively as our confession of our sinfulness. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your 
Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you only have I sinned and done with that which is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Make me hear with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Deliver me from death, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. For you have no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. May we let these words of the ancient psalm be ours. And now may the almighty and merciful God, who desires not the death of a sinner, but that we turn from wickedness and live and accept your repentance, forgive all of your sins, and restore you by the Holy Spirit to newness of life. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 269, again, Lord, throughout these 40 days, and we will sing verses 4 and 5. You may stand. And now as we depart, whatever wilderness the Spirit has brought you to, walk in boldness as a beloved child of God. Walk in peace under the shelter of the Most High. Walk in, walk in faith knowing that Christ walks with you. Amen.